Hello, hello, hello. Live. We're on. I believe we're on. I believe we're live. We're back on Facebook. It's a long time. Uh, you might know that I've been away from Facebook for some time. Um, not by my uh, wishes, but more by Facebook's wishes. But anyway, I'm back now. And it's nice to be back, and I've got some questions to go through today, and I hope everything's okay in terms of um, audio and stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to assume it is. Oh, I can post it here. Um, oh, no, I don't know how to work that. Anyway, I'm assuming the audio is working. Hi, Shona. Can, is the audio working? Is the audio working, Shona? I'm going to assume it is. Is that a big assumption to make? Um, could put a new. I haven't planned this. Welcome back. So it's working. Is it work? Can can oh God? Can you hear me? Oh, it came up like that. Can you hear me? Is the audio is is it working? audio I assume it is I'm assuming it's working um, yes we've got positivity reflection good audio is working so let's go let's do this let's do this we prepared some questions if you've got any questions but by all means ask uh, here and live um, good finally we've got some thank you audio is working good um, so, yeah, here we go. Let's do this. Um, we have a question that says risks of local anesthesia. Did that wobble? All right. Risks of local anesthesia. Um, I think this is because people. I'm, I'm doing a case on Friday, a local anesthetic case, and this patient sort of worried about it. Um, so there's not that much. Thanks, Sonia. Welcome back to me. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you. Um, I think I didn't. There's not a great deal of. I mean, obviously, local anaesthetic is uh, less risky than uh, general anaesthetic. Local anaesthetic is when you stay awake and you do an injection in the bit that you're that you're operating on. So, uh, operate locally, just around the area that you're operating on, so the rest of your body is not anaesthetized. Whereas a general anaesthetic, your whole body is anaesthetized. I don't know if I need to explain that. It's not obvious what local anaesthetic is. So, um, the point about local anaesthetic is, is much less. Uh, risks than a, than a general anaesthetic, but I guess the main things, and I think the reason the main thing people want to know about are things like sometimes it does knock you back. I think the whole procedure of a local anaesthetic is quite stressful. Uh, we call it a minor procedure often when we're doing a local anaesthetic, but it's not really minor to the patient. It may be minor to us, but there's no such thing as a minor pr procedure or a minor operation, really, because any operation is a major undertaking for someone. So I think it does knock you back. Hi, Donna. Good to see you here. Um, so I think it does knock you back. It can be stressful, uh, and uh, we had a patient the other day who uh, said he had a headache for like, ages afterwards <laughs> because of the stress. Before I don't think the anaesthetic caused that. I think it's just the stress of the procedure. Um, so it, we always say, look, bring someone with you if you're going to have a local anaesthetic case. The, the people who make the anaesthetic say you're not supposed to drive for 24 hours afterwards. Um, and I think that's, hi Roxana, I think that's because it is variable how people are adjust, adjust to it. I mean, most people have had a local anesthetic with their dental work, and sometimes you're fine afterwards, but sometimes you can feel a bit uh, a bit uh, jaded and a bit knocked back. The main thing from a medical point of view when you're talking about risks of a local anesthetic is from having too much anesthetic. That is a, there is a, there is a risk with anesthetic, local anesthetic, if you sort of overdose on it. So if you give too much and that's if the doctor gives too much anaesthetic to someone, then there can be there can be risks associated with it. So that's only really for big things. If you're having a mole or a cyst or a minor procedure, you're not going to overdose on local anaesthetic. But if you're having bigger things, and these days we do do bigger things under local anaesthetics, it's amazing what you can do. Actually, I think that's one of my questions. Yeah, don't want to don't want to 
don't want to get into my second question, but there it is amazing what you can do under local anesthetic. And um, when you do bigger things under low anesthetic, because there is a sort of toxic dose of anesthetic and it's dependent on your weight. Um, oh, look at that, Sonia's coming with a question. So it depends on your weight. There's a toxic dose of low anesthetic, so we don't want to go over that. So when we're doing a bigger thing under low anesthetic, a bigger procedure, breast augmentation, tummy tuck, uh, you know, facelift, something like that, um, we will tend to dilute the anesthetic and also we won't rely solely on the anesthetic or the local anesthetic will get local anesthetic um what we we they usually combine it with sedation they we i us them the doctors you know call it what you will um then people usually <laughs> have sedation as well as local anesthetic if you're doing a bigger case and what will what you'll find is that they you will be sort of sedated while the anesthetic's going in, sort of relatively heavily sedated, uh, while this dilute anesthetic is going into the area, and then the sedation will be brought back as the anesthetic starts to percolate around the area. But for a bigger case, you combine local anesthetic with sedation, and that those cases are sort of a bit drowsy, not like it's not purely local because it's not purely the area that's being anesthetized because you're a bit sedated. But um, often people prefer that having a general anesthetic. And, and that is those cases you are a bit more worried about toxic doses of anesthetic. You have an anesthetist there, you're being monitored. Um, and so it's something that um, is more maybe in tune with the risks of local anesthetic things. We as doctors would worry more about the risks of local anesthetic as we're putting more local anesthetic in, so doing bigger cases. But for normal, normal local anesthetic cases like mole cysts and stuff like that, it's the risks are pretty small and it's mainly. Um, feeling drowsy and a bit tired and you know feeling feeling a bit jaded afterwards um we've got some questions coming in thick and fast here oh my lord alive roxana you're a legend because you are relating to one of the mine well, in fact my next question i say my next question i'm going straight in with sonia because otherwise i'll might lose it sonia has said how long does it take for stitches to heal and swelling to stop after tummy tuck? How long is recovery for exercise and a normal life? Great question, Sonia. That's a great question. Um, what do I do? Do I answer that question or do I carry on with my local anesthetic theme? Oh, God, this is difficult. You know what, Sonia? I'm going to go to the local anesthetic question because I want to roll with local anesthetic. Stand by, Sonia. Stand by. I will get to your question, but I'm going to go straight into. Hi, Emma. Good to see you. Um, Roxana has said, can abdominal liposuction done under local, local anesthetic? And one of my preordained questions is what surgery can be done under local anesthetic? So I'm going to do those, then I'll straight back to you, Sonia. Sonia's back in with another question. Sonia, you're on fire today. You're going for the gold star. Keep it up. Um, what surgery can be done under local anesthetic slash and abdominal liposuction be done under local anesthetic. So you'd be surprised. So as I say, pure local anesthetic, you are limited because you're limited to the amount of local anesthetic you can use. So you are limited to smaller procedures. So usually things like moles, cysts, you can take quite big moles, tattoos, and do relatively big excisions, you know, big things under local anesthetic. But you can't do anything too invasive. As you get more invasive, um, and I would call abdominal liposuction a little bit more invasive. Um, things where there's movement, like liposuction particularly, is movement involved. Um, tummy tucks, particularly mini tummy tucks. You can do a full tummy tuck, uh, but ultimately mini tummy tucks, lifts, breast augmentations, face lifts, bigger sort of procedures. These can be done at local anesthetic, but it's usually local anesthetic com combined with sedation. So local anesthetic combined with sedation, you can do pretty much anything from a plastic surgery point of view anyway. Pretty much, you know, obviously really big belt lipectomies, you know, circumferential tummy tucks and body lifts and things like that probably wouldn't. Um, the main thing in my um, view that limits you when you're looking at local anesthetic sedation is the patient. You really, oh, I don't really push local anesthetic sedation on patients. Um, but if patients want it or don't want a general anesthetic, I think it is a really good option. But you have to have the patient on board because if you're not on board um, and if you think, oh, I can feel that, ah, that's uncomfortable, you're going to get stressed out and you're not going to enjoy it and you're going to have a bad experience and a bad memory of it and it's not going to be good. But if you're on board and you're up for it, it is brilliant, local anesthetic station, and you'd be amazed at what you can do. 
Uh, I've done breast lifts, tummy tucks, and breast augmentations. So uh, it, you'd be amazed what you can do under local anesthetic. But it really is dependent on the patient. So if the patient's on board and doesn't want a general anesthetic for whatever reason, then uh, it is a really good option. And you can do, as I say, for most things you can do, you know, mo most things with it, except sort of really extensive surgery. Um, and certainly abdominal liposuction is one thing. The problem with liposuction, I found, is the movement of liposuction. You know, you're never going to get rid of that movement. Your body um, So again, you have to be on board. Because if you're not on board, you think, oh my God, what are they doing? Even if it doesn't hurt, you're going to be on comfortable and freaked out about it. Oh, I don't like that. So it might be better just to have a general anesthetic. But if you want a local, and what we often do, because you need an anesthetist with you when you're doing local anesthetic and sedation, um, so the price is the same as a general anesthetic. So you don't, it's not less price because you still need an anesthetist there with you and the anesthetist actually has to work harder with the local anesthetic and sedation. But the other thing is, if you feel uncomfortable, if you think I'm not enjoying this, we prepare you for general anesthetic. So we can always convert you to a general anesthetic if you're having a local anesthetic and sedation. We always warn you of that and say, look, if you're not, if you're not enjoying it, we can just uh, switch to a general anesthetic. Um, but one of the benefits, Emma, uh, Roxana says, is local. Is local. Can be done under local, yeah. Um, Emma, you hit the nail on the head. I should have said that. Yeah, so why would people want local anesthetic and sedation? Well, one, there are risks with the general anesthetic. They're very small risks, but there are risks. So there's less risks with the local anesthetic and sedation. And uh, recovery is quicker. Yes, you're absolutely right, Emma. So you do tend to recover quicker. You do tend to get back on up on your feet uh, a bit quick, more, bit more quickly, um, and you can often just sort of walk out. And you know, in America, they can just they do things. They do call it office procedures. They walk out the door in their home, and they, you know, they don't have any nights in hospital and things like that. And we're probably going that way in this country, to be honest with you. But we're not. You know, we still probably we often do overnight stays and things like that. But yes, generally, you're often able to go home the same day with a local anesthetic and station, and you do tend to recover. There's not that hangover effect you get with a general anesthetic. You don't feel quite so groggy and disorientated and sick and things like that that you get with the general anesthetic. So Rosanna, I've asked your next question about costs. Yeah, the cost is the same, um, at least here it is. We, we charge the same because as I say, we still need an anesthetist. Um, and arguably, you could say you should pay the anesthetist more because they have to work a lot harder to um, maintain the sedation at just the right level. Um, it's probably easier for the anesthetist to do a general anesthetic. So yeah, the costs are the same. Um, Right, Holly's in with a question, but I'm before I lose it, I'm going to go back to. So yeah, that's good. That was good. That's a good start. Good start, I'd say. Huh? Agree. That was a good start. Um, that's as good as it's going to get, guys. So I think it's downhill for me. <laughs> Shouldn't say that because it's Sonia's after Sonia's question. No, should not say that at all. Respect, respect the audience. I'm respecting the audience. Um, I look a bit red-eyed. Is that me? Do I look red eyed? Anyway, um, Sonia, how long does it take the stitches to heal and swelling to stop after tummy tuck? How long is recovery for exercise and a normal life? Um, Sonia, I would say that tummy tuck is a big deal. Uh, it is a big deal. So uh, you have to be prepared. And one of the big things about any of this sort of stuff is getting people prepared before they have surgery because you don't want to have someone have surgery and then afterwards say, oh yeah, it always takes you know months to everything to settle. And they say, well, you, I, you didn't tell me that before. I thought I'll be back at work you know, in two weeks. So it's all about being prepared. That's what informed consent is. You know, When you sign your consent form, you've got to be informed of all the things that you can expect. And so that's what you're doing here. So I'm just so good on you for asking the question. Assuming you haven't had it because you might have had it already, in which case it's academic. But let's just assume you haven't. So how long does it take for sisters to heal? So um, there's different, there's three layers. Well, when I do it, there's three more, three slash four, but you don't care. There's different layers of stitches when you do a tummy tuck. Basically, there's deep stitches and then there's more superficial stitches. There's, there's a very deep, sometimes you do what's called quilting stitches, which are deep on the surface and then anyway you got a deep layer and then stitch it layer under just underneath the skin and then in the skin you can't see any of these stitches well sometimes you can see the ones around the belly button they're all hidden they're all dissolvable but they dissolve at different rates because you don't one of the risks of um not risks one of the problems when you do 
surgery like tummy tucks and breast reductions and, and what have you uh, is that the dissolvable sutures you have another tummy tape okay so yeah the dissolvable sutures if they take a long time to dissolve the body can get cheesed off with them and they can get infected and get little red spots and they can start to spit out so closer to the skin we put the stitches that dissolve a little bit quicker um, and then deeper down, we put stitches that take longer to dissolve because they're deeper down and they're further away from the skin. So the stitches take several months to dissolve. Um, I'm blurry and guttery. I'm blurry and guttery. Am I? Am I blurry and guttery? Oh my God, there's loads of questions. Steph, is it? Whose internet is it? Is my internet blurry and guttery? Don't say that, Steph. We've got new. Am I? Got new internet here. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn my, I'm on, am I on what? I shouldn't be on. I'm going to do something. Because I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I should be on. Right, I'm going to do something controversial now. I'm going to, I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off. Is it, is it blurry? Okay. Because I, why is it? I'm going to turn it off. So that might mean that I go, but I'm hoping it's going to mean that the Ethernet, because the Ethernet's plugged in, so it should go on Ethernet. Um, right, here goes. Three, two, one. I hope I'm still here. Am I still here? Has that worked? Am I still here? Am I still here? Am I on, am I on Ethernet? Is that oh Microsoft OneDrive? What? Am I still? Hello? Mic number one, mic number one. It's blurry, says Sonia. Uh, am I am I still here though? Is it still working? Is that made it you're here, but when you oh no. Flipping neck. Should have done it at home, shouldn't I? Still here, but it's blurry. We had new internet put in. So much for that. I think something else is going on. Just drop. The... What can I do? Is it? Should I just carry on? I don't know what these buttons do. Edit agenda. Anything. Looks all right to me. And she's just gone dark. Anyway, your lips don't move in time. Got a voice double. What can I do? Anyway, that's the, uh, I'm disappointed now. I was so excited. Should have stuck. All right, I'll stick with you. Was the Wi-Fi better? Was the Wi-Fi? Was it better before? Right, I'm turning Wi-Fi on. Wi-Fi back on. Is that better? More pixelated. I can hear you fine. Oh, man. Still, how's that? I'll turn the Wi Fi. Can hear you. Okay. Carry on. Yeah. You know, so much work goes into these, and then you get let down by technology. I've been preparing for this all day. You know, I'm excited. Been off Facebook for so long. Now I'm back. Now I get Wi-Fi. I didn't have this before. I did it at home before. I'm going to do it at home in future. This is what it's going to be like. This is the thanks I get. Look, Nick, Wi-Fi. Ah, oh, you know what? Am I on the wrong? Um, no, I think I'm on the right Wi-Fi. Ah, oh, no. No, I'm on the wrong Wi-Fi. I'm on the wrong Wi-Fi. Stand by. Right, guys, I will answer. Right, I'm going to answer questions. I've got a plan. So let's answer question while I'm doing this. God, I've got to go all the way down here. Uh, the question was oh, dissolvable sutures, wasn't it? It was Sonia. How long is so? Yes, they take months to dissolve. So basically, when it says how long does it take to heal after the tummy tuck, um, 
you know, it depends on you move my heel. So the skin is healed in about four days. So I put out five fingers, four days. The skin's healed in about four days. So the it's got the top layer of the skin, you know, you're healed in a week, but everything deep down takes longer. I've got it's blurry up. Everything take, take, take deep down to get the full strength of the um, closure takes months. Um, so you're looking like six to eight weeks to get. You're never going to get the strength as full as it was before as normal skin. But about six to eight weeks to get that strength in all the layers, all the deeper layers. Um, and that's why those sort of deeper sutures are holding it all together. So. Um, the recovery for exercise. So I normally say the first week, um, professional, don't worry, don't worry. I know what I'm doing. Okay, I'm just giving my password because I think I'm on the wrong one. In fact, I might not need it. I'm going on a better part. I'm going to get a better Wi-Fi. Stand clear, stand clear. Boom. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. How's that? Is that better Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi. Huh? Is that better? That's what I'm talking about. Can't be good at everything. Ooh, how dare you? Good at, good at Wi Fi and stuff. You know what I'm doing? Hmm? How's that? No? Is that not better? Have I done that? Hey. Stand by, guys. I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I know what I'm doing here. Johnny. Johnny, Johnny, I just did Johnny. Johnny, call it Johnny. Johnny. Okay, can hear you better. Hear you better. Hear you better now. Wi Fi on. I think this is going to come. I think this is going to come good. I... Okay, give me. So yeah. So so, so normally, say the first week after a tummy tuck, you're not going to feel like doing much um, because you're going to be knocked back and it's going to be tight. And um, going to be tight and you're not going to feel like doing much. Second week you're going to be feeling better so you're going to be pottering around the house um, and um, you know working, pottering around the house and um, and doing bits and bobs. After the second week, I normally say you can start getting back into gentle stuff. Gentle stuff means things like um, walking, not running, obviously. Well, maybe not obviously, but walking, not running. Um, uh, like exercise bike, swimming. Swimming's really good. Um, you know, stuff like that. Um, gentle stuff. And a lot of it, is you know listen to your body um listen to your body and um if it hurts don't do it so um start gently just because i said you can do stuff doesn't mean you can do stuff just start gently this is glitching isn't it Answering simply yes or no is this glitching it is um so um so um yeah so i normally say that um it takes after about well four to six, say six weeks with tummy tuck um you can start getting back into exercise with your core with your with your abdomen um a lot of this i don't need to tell you you know, in the first few weeks, you're not going to feel like doing stuff with your abdomen. Um, but after four to six weeks, then you can start doing stuff with your abdomen and you can sort of gradually build up. And just because I've said it's OK to go about four to six weeks doesn't mean that you should go for it and do circuits and do goodness knows what. You've got to sort of go gently at it, uh, take it easy and uh, build it up. 
Um, so um, yeah, so first couple of weeks not doing much, two sort of six weeks I suppose, gently swimming, cycling, walking, things like that. And then after six weeks you can start getting back into the more exercise-y type stuff. Um, um, so yeah, how long is recovery exercise? And a normal life. Uh, so the scar's red, the scar takes time for it to settle and fade. So you can start getting back into stuff about six weeks. And then normally I say things start to settle around three months. It, but it can take six months, 12 months, even eight, even longer for everything to fully settle. That means the redness to fade, the numbness, you often get numbness in the skin, you often get twinges, pain, you know, aches and pains and stuff like that. So, you know, oh, you know, it takes a year or more for everything to feel totally normal. A normal life, um, maybe after about three months you start getting back into a normal life, I would say, maybe three months, a normal life. Uh, so you start getting into exercise about six weeks, but that's just starting, and then you gradually build it up. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about this Wi-Fi thing. Just I've got all this Wi-Fi stuff in the clinic, you know, got a new... Wi-Fi con Virgin connection. We've got a new thing for Wi-Fi. Anyway, this is plugged in. This is Ethernet. I don't know why I shouldn't even use Wi-Fi, but I'm on Wi-Fi because he said it's better. Anyway. Anyway, enough of my problems. Um, so, Roxana, we've done that. Hello from Emma. Sonia, sorry, another question the same as I've asked for tummy tuck, but for inner thigh skin removal. Similar. You know what, Sonia? The stuff that I've just said, First week, you not feel like doing much. Second week, you start getting back into stuff, pottering around the house, doing computer stuff. After two weeks, gentle exercise with your lower body and things like that. And then four to six weeks for upper body stuff or for tension on the area stuff. It's the same for everything. Breast augmentation, you know, those ballpark things are the same for everything. So uh, inner thigh, skin removal, the same. All this stuff, you know, breast uh, breast augmentation, mastopexy, tummy tuck, uh, inner thigh, skin removal, um, inner thigh, skin removal, thigh lift, I think you're talking about that. All this stuff is closing stuff tight, so you've got to be careful, basically. Um, most plastic surgery is tightening the skin. Age uh, rejuvenating surgery is tightening saggy skin, basically. So most of the surgery we do, we close wounds under tension, so you have to be careful with um, how you, um, how you uh, um, mobilize and how much you do afterwards, so you don't want to put too much tension on it. So, yeah, pretty similar, but... Uh, thigh skin removal. Uh, is it normal to have Holly straight in Holly? Um, you know, I'm a little bit up. Um, I'm a little bit upset about the blurriness, but you know, I'm gonna. Did it go blurry? Did it stop? Anyway, what's this arrow up here? God. Oh Lord, can you see any of this? Oh good God, what have I done? Ooh, what have I done? Right, ignore that. So, Holly, Holly, nice to see you here tonight. Is it normal to have enlarged flanks six weeks post tummy tuck? How do you tell if swelling or fat? Um, yes, to Holly, it is normal to have enlarged flanks six weeks post tummy tuck. You, um, Question I would ask, I'm way behind on the questions, Holly, so I don't know if you've said this higher up. Your lips don't move into, oh, that's something else. Well, right, Holly, nope, what's nope? Oh, goodness me. Right, I'm just gonna push on, Holly. Uh, so the question I'd ask is, have you had liposuction to your, to your hips and flank area? Because obviously that's gonna make things swell a bit more, um, paradoxically, because you might say, what? I just had liposuction, why is my hips and flanks look big? Because the whole point of having liposuction is to make them small, but liposuction is quite traumatic and causes swelling. But even if you haven't had swelling, uh, even if you haven't had liposuction, you do get swelling in a tummy tuck and you might get swelling in your flanks. And six weeks post tummy tuck is quite early, Holly, because it's a balance. What I say to people is that when you first have surgery, you don't do anything because you're like, oh, it's really sore and I'm not going to do anything. And then you start to feel a bit better and you start to do a bit more. And so what happens is obviously it swells because you have surgery, but you don't do anything, so the swelling goes down. But then you start to feel a bit better and you start to do stuff and the swelling goes up. So the swelling goes up and down. You think, oh crikey, I've done too much, I'm gonna back off and do less. So around six weeks is the time you start getting back into stuff, you know, getting back into the gym and you're probably feeling a bit better about yourself and you're feeling, oh, I can do stuff. But as you do stuff, you swell more. 
it's okay. You don't worry about it as long as you don't go overboard and if it doesn't hurt and stuff. If it hurts, back off. But if it doesn't hurt, it's good to get into things. But um, um, but it does it does swell and it is normal at six weeks to have swelling. At six weeks, that is not you know. I normally see people at six weeks. I see people at one week, six weeks, and, and you know, there's often swelling. There's often one's more than the other, and scars spread and all that stuff. Yeah, I normally say things start to settle around three months. Start to settle for three months. That's quite a long time. Three months. So you're only halfway there. So yeah, it's absolutely fine. Uh, but it's oh, it's swollen at six weeks. Um, Roxana loves my live chats. Roxana, I'm, I feel I'll let you down with a blurriness, and I'm, I'm going to have a word with Johnny tomorrow. We'll see what we can do about that because I think it's. Well, I know what I can do. I can do it from home because I was better at home, wasn't I? No, there's a problem at home. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop messing about with that. Donna, at what stage can I go swimming after tummy tuck? Basically, what? Well, Don, what I would say is, uh, in fact, I should have the disclaimer. Should have a disclaimer, shouldn't I? Yeah, I'll do that next time. Saying, you know, talk to your surgeon and do what your surgeon says, don't do what I say, unless I'm your surgeon, obviously. In which case, do what I say. But um, talk to your surgeon is the thing, and do what your surgeon says. But in my um, uh, view, the you have a uh, you have a dressing on. We take the dressing off a, a week. Uh, see, check your wound. Don't, normally, don't give you a dressing after that. Sometimes you get a little pin pick of blood here and there. You might get a little bit that hasn't healed up properly. So we give you a bit of a gauze to wear inside your binder for a few days. When you take the binder off, the gauze just falls off, and you have a look at the gauze. If it's got stuff on it, put another bit of gauze on. When that dries up and you don't need any more gauze, you can go swimming. So basically, when you don't need any dressing and you can wear underwear and you know stuff like that, and there's no stuff on the underwear, so your wound is closed, then you go swimming. So that's when you can go swimming after a tummy tuck. So I would say probably two to three weeks after a tummy tuck, probably, um, when everything's sort of uh, dry. Uh, now we're into the comments now where I'm all blustery. What can someone do to minimize the risk of infection or complications from any surgery? Jade, that's a professional question. That's like a ringer. That's a ringer question. Jade, you're a ringer. You're like someone that I've put out there. But if you were, I wouldn't say that. So clearly you're not. But that's a good question. Um, so. I, I don't want to be airy fairy, Jade. I don't want to be make out as if I'm some kind of, you know, but I think positive mental attitude is really, really important. So being positive about stuff, you have to know about all the risks, all the complications, and we'll tell you all the bad things that can happen if you can have surgery. You have to know that because we go back to informed consent. You have to decide whether you're going to make, uh, whether you can have surgery or not. So it's important to have um, all the information as to whether you can have surgery or not. But once you've decided to have surgery, given that you know all the risks, um, because most surgery, certainly cosmetic surgery, the risks are really small, you have to be positive about it. Don't focus on it. Don't go on about, oh, you know, I'm worried I'm going to get this or that. Um, you know, try and be positive about it. Try and think positively. Um, I think that is really important. Um, what else can you do? Look after yourself. Stay fit, stay healthy, fresh fruit and veg. Eat a good diet, good healthy diet. Obviously, you can have wounds there to heal, so you need good nutrients, good nutrition, vitamins, uh, minerals, and that's usually with a good, healthy, balanced diet. Don't smoke. Um, smoking is the bane of our lives, to be honest. I haven't got anything against smokers. It's fine. I understand it's a um, popular uh, pastime. All my family, well, not my family, but my father and my brother and all that sort of, they all smoke all the time. Um, so it's fine if you want to smoke, but don't smoke if you're having plastic surgery, because as I said earlier, everything tight. And every time you take a cigarette, reduce the risk you reduce the blood flow to your skin and you increase your risk of wound healing so don't smoke that's the massive one um uh infection you have to be um optimized so if you've got any problems certainly things like diabetes um high blood pressure any sort of medical problems these have to be optimized so you try and make them as good as they're going to get um and it might be already as good as you're going to get but if you're in a bad way with your diabetes at the moment it's all over the place get that stabilized before um, having surgery. Um, uh, you need to avoid the sun in order to, well, that's not really infection, that's really for the redness on the scar. So what else for infection? Um, look out for signs of infection, and if you see any signs, go see your doctor early, get in touch with your doctor early, so you get treated early. Um, there's not a lot else so we can do to stop infection, because we already do everything we can to stop infection. So cover you with antibiotics when relevant, um, you know, 
appropriate dressings. So everything we do, we do to minimize infection for everybody. If there was something we could do to minimize it more, we'd do that for everybody. We wouldn't be sort of withholding that. So, you know, doctor wise, we do everything we, we can um, already. Um, Alicia Marie, hi. I was wondering how long it takes for a subcutaneous cyst, uh, sorry, sebaceous cyst, I think that is, um, to be removed and whether there's any risk of it coming back. Thanks. Great question. These are great questions tonight. I've got to say, you guys are doing really well. I'm letting you down with my blurry, blurry visage, but you are doing a great question. Great job with the questions. You there, I'm talking to you. You're doing a really good quick job. So well done, you. And um, and I apologize for the uh, for the uh, communication issues. Um, so uh, so the actual removal of a spacious cyst, they're normally not huge. You know, they're normally sort of, oh, it's all, whoop, that looks a bit weird, that sort of side, you know, oh, I'm going off, I'm going the wrong way. Anyway, they're normally, you know, not you, not, not that side, you know, they, it could be a big one on the back or something. But anyway, so they're normally not. So um, 45 minutes, I'm going to say, to remove it, um, give or take. Uh, sometimes it depends if they've been infected before they're more difficult to remove because there's scar tissue around there if they've never been infected they sometimes shell out quite nicely sometimes they're more difficult so give or take 45 minutes uh, there is a risk of it coming back if you leave any of the cyst wall behind that's why did I do a blog post? I've never talked about this about something anyway that's why yeah I did a blog post about it I think this week or I think I just did it on a month what day is it today it's Tuesday I did it yesterday no, skin cancer yesterday, I did one last week. Anyway, point is, if you leave any of the cyst wall behind, it can come back, which is why when sometimes it gets infected and bursts and all this stuff comes out, people think, oh, thank goodness for that, it's gone, um, because it looks like it's gone. But the cyst wall's still there, so it comes back. So the best way to, to, to not have it come back is to excise it, cut it out, which is a minor op. But what we need to do when we excise it is to make sure we get all of the cyst wall out. Because if we leave any of the cyst wall behind, it can come back. So there is a risk, but we need to make sure we get all of it back out, minimize it, the chance of coming back. Jittery, how do you spell jittery? Uh, jittery, I think, yeah, I think it's an I, Steph. I'm going to go I, jittery, G-J-I, but I'm not entirely sure how you spell um, jittery. Uh, any other um, spelling questions? I'll happily try, but... Um, yeah, blurry. Yeah, that's spelled correctly. You're here, but when you speak, it's breaking up. I think these are all old, are they? Yes, yes. Oh, God. So I'm not. You're blurry still. Slow. Your lips don't move. Should have stuck with your Wi Fi. Pixelated. Here you find. Carry on. These are all. Just carry on. All right. Okay. I think I have. Alicia, I'm wanting a subcutaneous system. Is there any risk of it coming back? Oh, Alicia. So, yeah, refer to my minute ago. There is, but the best way to reduce the risk of coming back is having it sized. You've got to make sure we get it all out. Oh, you're a good surgeon, can't be good at everything. Thanks, Sonia. Um, Emma, I'm having trouble with my TT scare. I have a wound issue. It's quite deep. How long do you think for recovery? I've sent a PM. Right. Okay. This is what I'm talking about. Emma, this is what I'm talking about. I am going. I've gone off. Am I still on screen? I've gone off. I think I'm going to go tab and move that tab aside. I'll have a look. This is what I'm talking about, Emma. I'm going to have a look. PM, presumably that means on Facebook, does it? So I'm going to have a look on Facebook to see if I can see your, your wound. Doesn't matter. Uh, voice is fine. So, Emma, while I'm doing that, I'm going to go for Donna's question. Oh, there's me. I'm on live now. Frozen. I'm nearly six, that's probably gonna mess things up, isn't it, by looking at myself. Um, I'm nearly 60 years old and BMI 33. I'm scared to commit to a panectomy uh, because of my age. I have this morbid thought about the bit you cut off and throw away. Um, so, um, yes. So it's it's uh, it's called a panacele, paniculectomy, so, um, yeah, well, Donna, I think 60 is fine. Um, BMI 33 is a bit high. Uh, you would be better, if you can, to get your uh, BMI lower, ideally below 30 uh, for something like this. Your risk of um, complications will be less if your BMI is less than 30. Um, but age 60 is fine. 
age is not so much of an issue these days. It's more about um, medical or health or how you're feeling. Oh, Emma, I've got your photos here, so I'll have a look at those. Okay. Um, so Emma, I will I will answer your question. I'll just um, so um, got a morbid thought about the bit you cut off and throw away. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not, I've got the wrong question up yet. So, well, Donna, again, it's it's um it's it's informed. Um, oh yeah, paniculectomy. Yeah, it's it's informed consent and it's pros and cons. And it's like that with any surgery. There are. I wouldn't worry about, I don't know why you're worried about the bit you throw off or, or away, that stretched skin and fat, which you don't really want anymore. So I wouldn't, wouldn't worry so much about that. But I think it's reasonable to um, want to consider whether surgery is right for you because there is a potential for complications. As I said earlier, tummy tuck or um, apronectomy or paniculectomy or whatever you want to call it is a big operation and it's a big scar it's a lot of healing as i'm going to talk about in a minute um with um emma um so it is a you know there are risks of, of um of complications so you should be aware of it and your risk is higher if your bmi is higher so a bmi of 33 is uh, a little bit high i would say so if you are worried about the risks then you can if you can get your bmi lower that will reduce your risks so that's something you can do to maybe reduce your risk. You need to not smoke and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a balance. And first of all, optimize yourself a bit. Like I said, with the um, that's something I could have said with the infection. I could have said reduce, you know, less weight will reduce your risk of infection. So optimize yourself. So um, you know, if you're diabetic, get that right. High percent, you know, blood pressure. Um, get your weight right. Don't smoke. Do everything you can to optimize your condition. And once you're in optimized condition then you've got to weigh out the balance of the pros and cons. So the pros are getting rid of the um, big panace that you've got that you don't like, that you're carrying around, that you want to get rid of. The cons are the risks of surgery, of healing, of complications. And if the risks of the surgery outweigh the benefits, then don't have surgery. But if the risks are outweighed by the benefits, so if and, and only you will know what the benefit is because you're the one who's... Um, carrying around that extra tissue and if it's not that bad and you're really worried about having surgery then don't have surgery but if it's really bad and you're really uncomfortable and you want to get rid of it then it might be worth taking on the risks of surgery so it's a really hard one to say but you've got to balance it in your own mind uh, because at the end of the day you're the one who's got to sign the consent form and got to be happy with it yourself uh, you know with, with what you're having done so good you know Good luck with that, Donna, and I hope that's helpful. So, Emma, I'm having, yeah, I've got your photos, Emma. Thank you for that. That is excellent. Um, as soon as I have a hole, my surgeon just keeps it all naturally. Can you look at it and give me your opinion? Yes, I can, Emma. That looks lovely and clean, I would say. It is quite a big hole. Um, so, I can, that's really not nice for you to have there and really uncomfortable. And I'm really sorry that's happened, but that can happen because a tummy tuck is closed tight. So um, it is a thing that happens with tummy tucks. And um, I think that it is whoever's doing dressings, I'm assuming you must be doing dressings yourself because um, you are gonna need quite a lot of, you know, quite regular dressings there, is doing a wonderful job with the dressings. So um, the, the wound is beautifully clean, lovely and clean. There's no sign of any infection. Uh, I would say you've got to keep eating healthily, keep it positive. I know it's hard because you've probably had that for months. I don't know how long you've had it. You've probably had it for a long time, and you're going to have it for a long time more. There will be a time when this will heal. But at the moment, it might be hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's horrible when these problems happen because it's a horrible wound, and it's horrible to have to have that every day, and um, and it is difficult. And you just got to stay close, close with the surgeon. I would probably go with your surgeon. I mean, it depends on how long it's been going. Uh, and the, your surgeon's saying it will heal naturally. Naturally, you'd be amazed at what heals naturally, but it does take time. That's the problem. It will take ages, um, months, you know. Uh, I don't know what, I don't really, I don't really know how long you've had it or, um, or, um, or, you know, what's been happening so far, but it will take a long, long time. But I would say there's, there are positives about it. It's the lovely clean wound. You're doing a great job with the dressing. No sign of any infection. Obviously, that's something you'd worry about with a wound like that. 
it's a really tricky what happens you see when wounds open up people always think why don't you just stitch it up why are you leaving me with this horrible wound why don't you just stitch it up but the problem is it's opened up because it was stitched up really tight and the body said that's too tight man that's too tight Boom, i'm gonna open up oh that's better now if we stitch it up again we're gonna stitch it up tight again what's gonna stop it from because often what happens is you know often it's okay when you feel like you know, have the dressing off at a week and it sort of looks okay or maybe the skin sometimes looks a bit dodgy but you know and then it boom, opens up so it's really hard to know what to do with that um, uh, Emma it's it's a hard one it's um, I think your surgeons I think I would be I think it's reasonable what your surgeons saying go with it see how you get on if you um, the, it's, it's no easy answers because if you stitch it up it could open up again the other thing you could Think about is things like skin grafting it, which might make it heal a bit quicker. Certainly, it's looking lovely. You want to be in the situation where it's healing. People often think, oh, it's not healing. You've got to do something. When it's not healing, you've got to get it healing. So that means getting your, if you're diabetic, getting that sorted out. If you st smoke, stop smoking. Emma, if you st smoke, stop smoking right now, this minute, because um, that is not going to heal or it's going to take a hell of a lot longer to heal if you carry on smoking. I don't know if you do, I don't want to get you upset if you don't smoke but you know smoking is just a disaster for these sorts of things um so uh i was just saying oh yeah you've got to get it in a stage where it's healing when it's in a stage when it's healing if it's taking ages to heal that's the time you think about maybe skin grafting or something to hurry it up but if you skin graft it you're probably going to want that skin graft excised at a later date so you're going to probably need two operations if you if you let it heal on its own, you might not need any more operations. The scar won't be as nice as we like in that area, but you might just put up with it, um, given what you've been through, or you could revise the scar at a later date. But it's a difficult problem, Emma. It's uh, I'm sorry you're going through it, and stick close to your surgeon. Work with your surgeon. I think you and uh, you and he or she are doing a lovely job with the, with the wound at the moment, and uh, it's a difficult. You don't smoke. Sorry, sorry about the smoking thing then, um, but. Um, yeah stay positive stay strong but it's i know it's hard it's hard for the surgeon as well um because it's hard when you get complications it's one of the problems with this with this job um so so yeah that was good that's good emma like that live um i could on another, well, I probably wouldn't have shown your photos because we don't want to say anyone, but it's because uh, the people don't like wounds and things, but I can do sh sh talking to people and stuff. Oh, was that on Instagram? That was on Instagram. I think I can do it on this. I can talk to people. People can come on and talk, and I think I can share photos and stuff. Um, still hear you fine, just crap pick. Okay, can hear you fine. Sound is fine. Oh, God. I, I can see. Here we go. Lisa. Lisa. Lisa in the house. I don't know if you're still here. I don't know how long ago you gave this comment, and I'm sorry if I'm behind on my questions. I'm considering breast enlargement. I'm so frightened of general acidity. The only thing to stop me. Do you offer pre med? Yes. Um, yes, Lisa. Pre med's fine. But the only thing about pre med is a pre med is still, um, you still have, um, you still have a general aesthetic with the pre-med. Yeah, it doesn't just relax you before pre-med. The other thing, breast enlargement, Lisa, I don't know if you were earlier about the local anesthetic thing. You could have it with local anesthetic and sedation if you're really worried about um, general aesthetic. You do feel touch and movement and dirty pokery, but um, it, you don't have a general. You, 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 you're not fully awake. You are sedated, so you are quite tired, but it's an option if you're worried about general uh, anesthetic. Roxana, ladies, if you have muscle repair with the TT, week two of recovery, walking will be enough to exhaust you. Yeah, I mean, often you need muscle repair. And yeah, Roxana, you're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Um, it, it does knock you back and it, it can be uncomfortable. So often you get discomfort lower down because of the tummy tuck bit, which is tight, but you also get pain up here and discomfort up here because the muscles are often brought together and that can be uncomfortable. So um, nice one, Roxana. Big up yourself. Thank you for that. Donna is straight in here with a question. I had lipo to my back, fat rolls. I'm five weeks post-op and they are still there. Will they go eventually? It should, it should they be gone by now. My binder makes them roll over the top, which doesn't help. Absolutely, Donna. Difficult area, isn't it, for the binder? Those back rolls, if they're up here, the binder, it's hard to get above it with the binder. With you on that, Donna. Um, one of the problems with liposuction is you do liposuction for a bulge and 
often because it, life perception is quite traumatic, it swells quite a lot afterwards, and you still got a bulge. And people say, well, it's still there, or it's worse. What have you done? I paid all this money, I still got a bulge um, because it is quite traumatic. But the idea, and you say, I promise, I have done something. Um, you know, there's taking fat out. Honestly, I'm, I'm not a charlatan. Um, but people often think, well, I haven't done anything. So there is swelling, and five weeks post-op, Donna, is really early, really early. So don't worry, stay strong, don't worry. It will, oh, there was a question earlier, how do you tell swelling and fat? Oh yeah, I didn't answer that question, did I? So basically, um, the swelling will get better and fat won't. You can't really tell by looking at it, to be honest with you, whether it's swelling or fat. It's just that if you're five weeks or six, I think the last earlier one was six weeks post-op, it's likely to be swelling. So stay positive, stay strong. I say things normally start to settle, start to settle at three months. So five weeks, you know we're near. And it is, a binder can help, but the problem with the binder, as you say, is if it's in this area here, the, the, the swelling or well, the area operates on sort of above the binder, you can't get above it with a binder, so that can make the bit above the binder swell more. So it can be an issue, um, uh, Donna, to get, to get uh, compression on there. So maybe a tight T-shirt or just, mess, well, Stick with your surgeon, first of all, do what your surgeon says, but sometimes compressive t-shirts, like tight t-shirts and things might, or something else that might work to give you a bit of compression. Uh, Emery Morse's scar, and then she says, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to us. That's kind, Emily. Uh, Emma. And I called you Emily. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, but that is kind. It's, you're very welcome, and I'm sorry I'm glitchy. Um, Jade, I have read about the internal bra support with uplifts. Is this actually a thing? And what exactly is it? And how effective is this? Jade, I've done a blog post about this. So boom, right at you. If I could do a link to it, I would. Blog it up on the website. I need a search facility on my website, don't I? But I'm sure if you type in internal bra masterpexy styano, you'll come up with my blog post. Um, it is a thing. It is a thing, yeah, and it's a thing that is trying to keep the breasts up there because the problem when you do a mastopexy, when you do a breast lift without an implant, you always put the breast, the implant, uh, you always put the tissue up there, and then in time, gravity makes it settle. I'm not going to say sag because you're having the surgery because you don't want sag. You, you, you correct the sag. A mastopexy does create correct the sag, but it does settle to what I call a natural result, which means a concavity in the upper pole. You don't have a convexity in the upper pole. You don't have a bulge in the upper pole. You can't get a bulge in your upper pole of your breast, the upper part of your breast, without an implant. Implants can give you a bulge up here, but natural breast tissue will always settle. Now, this is out of a bra I'm talking here. You can always wear a bra and push your breasts up, and do stuff, and give yourself a bulge in the upper pole by pushing them up with a bra, but you can probably do that now without having a mastopexy at all. So this is out of a bra. The, the shape does tend to settle. So the internal bra is trying to fix that problem because it is a problem with mastopexies. And it, in that in term, those terms, it is a good thing. My personal view on the internal bra is that I have got reservations about it and I don't personally use it. it is, there are different types of these things and what they are is they are prosthetic, they are, um, they are, um, they are synthetic, they are um, support, so they might be, uh, it might be synthetic, it might be um, like uh, foreign body, like proline or something like that, um, like uh, something that's like an implant sort of thing, or sometimes you can use your own tissue, uh, not your own tissues, but tissues like a pig or um, uh, a cow dermis, so um, other animals, tissues, uh, it's called a dermal a matrix, a dermal template. Uh, but basically, it's a foreign body. It's a foreign body, and it goes in like a hammock somehow. There's one that's like a hammock. There's one that's like a cone, and they go underneath the skin to support the breast and keep it up there. The problem I've got is that you have to anchor it well, because if you don't anchor it well, it's just going to sag. The whole lot's going to sag with the with that supporting thing. So you usually have to anchor it to bone. That can be a little bit uncomfortable. If you get infection, it can be a nightmare, as in with any foreign body, infection is a nightmare. If you put a breast implant in, if it gets infected, you have to remove it. But with these things, because they sort of come incorporated into the tissues, it's even more of a nightmare to remove if they get infected, although that's rare. But um, uh, you can get pain where they're bone anchored, and you do have to do quite a lot of dissection in order to put them in. You worry about the skin cover and what have you. So for me, they're not quite there yet. 
but I guess you have to talk to someone who does them a lot to see whether it's a, a viable thing for you, but it's not something that's been sort of widely adopted because I, I don't think they're quite there yet, but the concept is sound to support the breast and keep it up there. But for me, I just say to people in my hands, I'll say, look, if you have an uplift, I will make the sag better. I will bring the breast up to a better place, but in time it will settle and you will get a concavity in the upper pole, which is a more natural look. And I'll show them photos of it and I say, look, if you want fullness up there, you can't have it or you have implants. But that's a big deal, having implants and a lift. And also implants make your breast bigger. So there's a whole can of worms there with implants. So I'm not saying you should have implants, but that's the that's the other option. Sonia back in. Sonia, you're you are going for the uh, you are going for the gold scar here. What did I say scar? Did I just say gold scar? Can we just scrub that? Can we just roll back um, star and scar? Um, what type of thigh surgery is available after a seven stone loss? Sonia, seven stone. Whoa, that's a big one. I've got loose skin at the top of my inner thighs. Good question, Sonia. We've got some cracking questions tonight, not like usual. These are really good questions. Um, so, Sonia, two options really for your thigh. Um, one option is, um, so thigh lifts, which we're making here. Um, so, thigh lifts you'll find are not that. Um, common when you search for on online, you'll find loads about tummy tucks and mastopexies and facelifts, but thigh lifts you won't find much. And the reason for that is when you do tummy tucks and mastopexies and facelifts, you can hide the scar quite well. Um, the problem with thigh lift is there's two options one is to put a scar in your groin crease to pull the, the, the thigh skin. I can illustrate to pull the thigh skin up. So if I'm pulling my trousers up, yeah, so you tighten the skin up. And the scar goes in your groin crease. But that's not too um, risque. Um, but, you know, put, put the scar right on it and pull the skin up and tighten the skin that way. The good thing about that is that the scar's hidden because it's hidden in your groin crease. You can't see the scar at all. Uh, the bad thing is this bad place for healing because it's up in your groin crease, hot, sweaty, risk of infection, risk of wound breakdown. There's a risk because you, whenever you do this, you're obviously closing it tight like all the other things I've uh, all the other sorts of uh, operations we talk about. The scar can migrate down. Um, but the main problem with it is it doesn't give a very good tightening of the skin. Because when you've got lax skin in your thigh, if you demonstrated to me what you wanted done, you would probably pinch your skin this way. You wouldn't pull it up this way. You'd probably pinch it this way. And if you're going to pinch it this way, you're going to get a scar. You see that? I'm more blurry, aren't I? So you might not be able to see my... Anyway, you're going to get a scar going down the inner thigh. And that is a bit more obvious. Well, a lot more obvious. Not a bit more obvious. It's a lot more obvious. It's a big scar down your inner thigh. In my experience, I think that is the best way to do it. A big scar down the inner thigh. Now, you aim for the scar to be hidden from the front of the back. But if you open your uh, knee out, you'll be able to see it. So people say, oh, I hate my thighs because I can't wear shorts and what have you. If you have a big scar there, you still might not be able to wear shorts because you might be, um, and you might be um, conscious about the scar. So um, those are the two ways of doing it. For a massive weight loss, which seven stone is, if you've got a lot of spare skin there, I think the best way is the is the um, is the transverse um, thigh lift um, with a with a, sorry, not transverse, transverse um, longitudinal thigh lift where it goes down the down the inside uh, of your leg. Um, so I think that is the best way to do it, but it has a big long scar and you might not be happy with that big long scar. But the other one where the scar is hidden gives less of, less of a lift and a more of a risk of wounding problems and, and other sorts of issues. So those are the two main ways of doing a thigh lift, um, Sonia. Um, so Kath, Tees, I've got a procedure book with yourselves. Well done you, thank you for that, excellent. Can't wait to see you. To have two moles removed off my face. And what about scarring? Would makeup cover? How long will it take to heal? Yeah, so uh, if it's just a, a, a mole, we were talking about earlier on about tummy tucks and stuff like that, how long it takes to heal. So a mole, that's usually just, you know, it's normally not that tight. So if it's on your face, there'll probably be stitches in your face. They may not be removable. So you, the wound will be healed in about, let's say, four, to eight, four days, call it four to seven days. The wound will be healed in about a week. Now, what we can do is we can give you a little, um, normally don't give you any sort of um, 
dressing, just give you a bit of ointment to put on the wound. But if you're worried about how it, how it looks, you can put a bit of um, tape. We can give you some sort of skin colored tape over the top if you want it covered. Um, in terms of makeup, you, you want the wound to be healed. You don't want any raw areas. It'll probably be healed in a week. I say a week to two weeks, put it like that, because it's hard to say for everybody. But a week to two weeks, once the wound's healed and there's no sort of little blood or little, you know, scabby bits or anything like that, then, um, then you can wear makeup. And usually that's five to seven days for the face. So just to cover myself, I say two weeks, but maybe after a week, it'd be all right to wear makeup. But it really depends on when you're, when you're, um, when you're healed. But yeah, week or, week or two, you'd be able to put some little bit of makeup on there. Uh, we have actually a massage yet after about six weeks, but you can put makeup on after about a week. Or so. But again, speak, I don't know, is it probably not me, is it? So you better speak to whoever's doing it, uh, Kath. I don't want to get in trouble with them. Um, it will either be Kuram or Azam, but um, don't say that I've said this. You know, we well, can say that I've said that, sure. What's best first, tummy tuck or inner thigh? It's a good question, Sonia. Whichever bothers you more, you can do them both together. Um, whichever bothers you more, Sonia, um, because uh, see how you go, get the worst one out of the way. Because if you have wound healing problems, issues, you think, oh my God, I'm not going to do surgery again. You know, do the one that, would, if you could only have one, get that one done first, and then if that all goes really well, then you might say, okay, I'll go get that one done. But there's no um, benefit from doing one first the, rather than the other. You can do whichever one uh, makes you feel better. Sonia, thank you for, Sonia, thank you for asking the questions. Thank you, because that's, you know, always worries me. I'm not going to get questions. I've got loads of questions today. Um, so that is excellent. So we've got a question here from someone. Her, I said. Uh, we're going back to the um, ones in the, in the bank. On block, total capsulectomy implant removal. That sounds, oh, who's the new surgeon, Jade? Ooh. Um, so um, on block, I'll tell you in a minute. On block, total capsulectomy implant, teaser. Wait, you have to wait. On block, total capsulectomy implant removal. Uh, yeah, someone asked about this, on block. I mean, that sounds fancy, doesn't it? Honestly, you people, it's a problem with the internet. You get on the internet and you use all these terms like paniculectomy and other sorts of terms like, you know, I don't know. But anyway, technical terms. Um, you know, you learn all this stuff and they'll blimey, you're going to do an on block total capsulectomy at the time of the uh, implant removal. I, the bottom line is, I wouldn't worry about this stuff so much. You know, I think you can worry, there's stuff you've got to worry about, whether you have surgery, the pros, the cons, and all that, choosing your surgeon and all that. But I wouldn't get into the technicalities of it too much. I think people do get into the technicalities of this these days quite a lot. And you think, you know, there's nothing's black or white. You try and someone says, oh, you've got to have an on block total capsulectomy. You must have that. Otherwise, it's all terrible. Oh my God, I must have that. You know, well, if other people don't do an on block total capsulectomy, why, why, why don't they if that's the bit? Anyway. anyway. So um, I will talk about it anyway. So, to, to, so basically, when you, what we're talking about here, in case you don't know what on earth I'm talking about, is a, uh, when you have a breast implant, or any implant in fact, but uh, usually we're referring to breast implants when we talk about capsulectomy, the implant gets walled off in scar tissue, that's called that scar tissue, it's called a capsule. Over time, that capsule contracts and goes hard and is uncomfortable, and so you might want a capsulectomy, which is uh, removing that capsule. And an on-block total capsulectomy means that you remove the implant with the capsule in all in one, one go. You remove it as one big ball. So you remove the whole shebang um, to make sure you don't leave any behind. But like when you assist, you know, you don't leave any of this wall behind. You do the whole lot to make sure you've got the whole lot out. You don't want to remove it piecemeal. And um, if you're just having an implant removal and not having it replaced, well, backtrack. If you want an on-block total capsulectomy because you've read that's a good thing to do, fine. You can do it on. We can do an on-block total capsulectomy, no problem at all. If you ask me what I would do, if someone hasn't got any problems, any symptoms, if they're not worried about the capsule, if there's any worry, if it's got swelling, a lump, we think there's any sinister about it, you would do an on-block total capsulectomy and send all that capsule off to histology to have it checked over. If you weren't worried about it. Personally, if you're just having the implants removed and not replaced, I would take a bit of the capsule, send it off for histology, but I wouldn't take all of the capsule out because it's quite a big deal to do a total capsulectomy, to take all of that capsule out. You leave quite a big, low, big raw surface, it's quite traumatic, it's quite uncomfortable, it bleeds quite a lot. And also, 
we always try and just take the capsule out but you're inevitably going to take a little bit of breast tissue away the more breast tissue you, you take away you're going to take some volume out of that breast um, and so if you leave the capsule behind then you're going to have more volume there and if you're not putting another implant back in again it doesn't matter because the capsule you're not worried about capsule contraction anymore because you haven't got an implant as capital tissue is just scar tissue so it's okay to leave so if you're taking the implant out and not replacing implants i would personally not do a total capsulectomy and i think this is what this patient was asking about so but if you want one i you know we can do one if you're replacing implants it's a different kettle of fish because if you're replacing implants then there's the risk of another capsule coming around there so you can discuss whether you have a total capsulectomy or partial capsulectomy or capsulectomy because the more you do so the more of a the more capsule you remove the more scar tissue you create so the more scar tissue, the more, more the quicker a capsule comes second time around. So you might, I often would do a total capsulectomy if I'm putting new implants in, especially if I'm changing the type of implants. So going from silicone to polyurethane, for instance, you don't want to do a total capsulectomy at that, uh, in those circumstances. So I would often do a total capsulectomy if I'm putting new implants in again. Although again, people do sometimes do partial capsulectomies because they feel it's too traumatic to take all of the capsule away. It's going to create more cap trauma to take all that capsule away which is going to create another um, capsule come quicker because trauma causes scar tissue I made that, I don't know if I made that clear so if you if you do too much trauma you may get all of that old capsule away but you traumatize the breast so much you created more scar tissue so a new capsule will come quicker so some people take the view that they leave a little bit of capsule behind if it's really firmly stuck um, because it'd be too traumatic to remove it so that'd be a partial capsule to me but this is something you need to if you want to talk to the consultant about and if you get on with your surgeon and you've got a good surgeon i just trust them with what they think is right but obviously if you've got a strong view then you can have it but that's that's on block total capsulectomy do your prices include consultations follow-ups etc yes uh oh no uh, right well uh consultations we charge 100 pounds for the initial consultation if it's a oh jade you've got a who's a new surgeon if it's a um, if it's a, bre a if it's a breast or tummy tuck or a big op, it's a hundred pounds. If it's a minor op like a mole assist, split ear low, inverted nipple, areola reduction, tattoo removal, something like that, they're free. They're free consultations. But for a bigger op like the moles and cysts and stuff, it's um, hundred pounds. But then you only pay for the first consultation. All the follow-ups are included, so you don't charge for any follow-ups before or after surgery. So it is all included. Jade, who does new surgeon? So we've got two surgeons currently. We've got Kram Khan, uh, who works at the Children's Hospital, and Azam Froa, who works at the QE, that's their NHS posts. Um, uh, Azam does mainly skin. Uh, and we, the new one is, called, is uh, it's called Kirsten, and she is also working at the Children's Hospital. And she is gonna be, she's been, she, I say she's new, she's been a, a, a surgeon for many years. Um, but she's new to working here, which is very exciting because we're getting really busy and which is great. And she will start in the next few weeks, I hope. Um, just getting the paperwork and everything. So, yeah. So, uh, Kirsten is a new one. So, um, can you remove multiple lipomas at the same time? Yeah, you can. And often lipomas are multiple. Lipomas are little fatty lumps underneath the skin. And often you can remove them by making a little cut, a little sort of stab, a little tiny stab incision and squeezing them out unlike cysts cysts clinically can look a bit like lipomas because they're lumps underneath the skin um strictly speaking cysts are lumps in the skin but you know lumps um but a cyst you have to remove all of that cyst wall so you often have to make a bigger incision you have to make an incision almost as big as the cyst almost as wide as the diameter of the cyst to get a cyst out because you have to carefully get all that cyst wall out uh, a lipoma on the other hand is just a fatty lump so you make a much smaller incision for a lipoma and you can squeeze the squeeze the, the, the lipoma to make it pop out. So you can remove multiple lipomas. Um, um, I've removed hundreds of lipomas on one patient. Um, not I don't I don't encourage that, but you can certainly move in several lipomas on patients. Um, um, under local anesthetic, you wouldn't really let that that you know too many, but it's certainly possible and quite common to remove multiple lipomas at uh, the same time. That's quite quite easily done. Jade, thank you for asking the questions and good to have me back. Uh, good to be back. I mean, and I'm sorry I'm blurry. 
and um, try and be less blurry in future. Self-harm scars. I have had a look on your website and I was curious to see if my scars from self-harming many years ago could be revised. They're very old and in a very awkward place. The two that are laid together are on my chest. The others are on my tummy. Um, so normally when someone asks a self-harm question, they're usually on the forearm and they're usually old. They're usually very well healed and often hard to do anything about because they're usually multiple. Um, when you have a, and we can't remove scars. So um, if you've got a scar and you don't like it, we can't remove it. There has to be something about the scar that we can give you a different scar that's better than the scar you've got already. And often self-harm scars are actually, as scars go, good scars, but it's the um, psychological memory of what it is and what people perceive it to be when they see the, the scar that's the problem, and we can't do anything about that. So in those terms, it's usually cognitive camouflage makeup, and we can't really do much about it. If the scar's stretched or dented in or raised up, there might be something we can do. Um, to fix those problems. This is a little bit different, this patient, because she says they're on her um, uh, chest and thigh, was it? Chest, I don't know, chest and tummy. Um, now, the chest is a bad place for scarring. It can go hypertrophic scarring, keloid scarring, you can get raised, red, ugly scarring. So if it's raised, red, ugly scars, then there are things we can do, steroid injections, silicone gel, silicone sheets, uh, maybe even intralesional excision, maybe even cutting it out as a last resort. So if the scars are raised, then there might be something to do. If the scars are stretched, so often they are not stitched. Often people don't go to a and &E time and stitch, so they often need them to help themselves. So they're often a bit stretched. We could maybe try to make it a bit less stretched. Whether that's going to help or not is often marginal, unless it's really stretched. If it's only a little bit stretched, it's often marginal doing that sort of stuff. Um, but as a general rule, it's really hard to make these sorts of scars better because they're usually... Um, cut with quite a sharp um, instrument which leaves quite a good scar you know quite as scars go it's a it's a good scar often i don't I haven't seen these scars but it's really tough to improve self-harm scars and we certainly can't remove the psychological sequelae of, of it last question they're still there anyway last question No, I'm going to put a roller. How do I do a roller? Oh, I've forgotten how to do this. Crawler. I'm going to do a crawler. We're on the last question. Is the crawler working? Does it work? Anyway. I'll prepare this, shouldn't I? Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Right. Last question. Oh, that was worthwhile. Um, right. Last question. Can all tattoos be removed by surgical excision? No. No, they can't. Some people are really, really um, surprised that tattoos can be removed by surgical excision at all. Some people think that only tattoos are two centimeters. I've heard people say, oh, and two centimeter tattoos can be removed. Where'd that come from? Basically, you've got to pinch the skin. If you can pinch the skin, you can, you can cut it out. That's if it's a mole, if it's a birthmark, or if it's a tattoo, it doesn't matter. If you can pinch that bit of skin, you can cut it out. And so depending on where it is, you can pinch a bigger bit of skin in some places than others. So back of the hand, you might think, oh, I can pinch a lot of skin there. But you've got to remember, you've got to make a fist. As soon as you've got to make a fist, that skin, that skin tightens up. So you actually can't move much skin from the back of the hand. Tummy, move loads, especially if you lost weight. You know, tummy tuck, look at the amount of skin you move on a tummy tuck. If you had a tattoo that size, you could move it all. If you had a tattoo of all your lower abdomen, you can move it all by doing a tummy tuck. Not only if you'll have tattoos in that area, but you know, the point is you can take big bits of skin out from certain areas when there's laxity. So you've got to look at the area of, this, of, the, of the tattoo as to how much skin elasticity there is and the size of the tattoo. You've got to get those two, two, two things together. Um, and when people say only two centimeter ones can be removed, 
you are limited to how much you can move, but you can do serial excision. I mean, some people talk about skin graft. I don't like skin graft and tattoos. Skin grafts don't look good. Um, skin grafts don't look like normal skin. So I don't think that's a good thing to do for tattoo personally. Um, but you can do serial excision. So if it's too big to remove in one go, you can do it in several goes. You can do serial excision, take a bit out, come back in three, three to six months, and then take another bit out. So you can take bigger question, bigger tattoos out. But not all tattoos can be removed by surgical excision. These people with these big ones on the shoulder, we have one today, big one on the arm, whole forearm. I can't, you know, that's just not not a goer. So the whole shoulder, massive ones on the back. You can't take that much skin out. As I say, I don't think skin grafts are a good option. So I think, and I think, to be honest with you, for all tattoos, laser is the first option. I always say this to everybody. Lasers, I don't, we don't do laser, but it is the first option. So if laser doesn't work or for whatever reason you don't want to do laser, then you can consider having a decision. I had a tattoo around my belly before Tommy Tuck. Oh, there you go. There you go. Got a real life person there. Emma, said it done. Emma, thank you for your comments. Good luck with everything. Hope everything goes well. Try and keep your chin up. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. There will be an end to this. And I know probably on a daily basis you can't see an end, but it's it, it will come. And just stick close with your surgeon. I think you're doing a great job with the dressings, both you and your surgeon, and just stay positive. Keep fighting the fight. Right, thank you for that. Um, thank you, oh, there we go. Thank you for your time and expertise, but you'd be glad to get home. I've got to go pick up my, pick up my son, actually. I'm going to be late because of all my technical problems with our internet. Anyway, um, right, I'm going to check out, and I'm going to see you next week right here, assume I don't get banned again, on Facebook, 7 o'clock. Ask your questions, direct message me, or get in touch any way you want, and I'll be happy to ask your questions, and I'm going to end it here. Peace be with you and have a nice evening.